A new lawsuit filed by PETA may be a big step towards seeing animals in a new way, especially when it comes to the Animal Welfare Act. And it's all because the Constitution prohibits a bill of attainder. A bill of what? Uh, That's next on the PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, Bill of Attainder? What's that? And why should you care? If it helps animals, that's why. Simply put, a Bill of Attainder is an act of legislation that declares a person or group guilty of a crime and then punishes them without a trial. Essentially, it nullifies that person or person's rights. The Constitution prohibits such things. But in practice, when it comes to the Animal Welfare Act, legislation was enacted to declare specific species of animals like birds, rats, and mice used in research be banned from protection under the animal law. Congress, led by the legendary segregationist North Carolina conservative Jesse Helms, passed the amendment in 2002, but was it legal? That's the basis of the lawsuit. Asher Smith is litigation manager for the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals Foundation. He has recently won historic victories against exhibitors who appeared on Netflix's Tiger King, setting precedents that decline cub petting and separation of baby big cat cubs from their mothers is against the law. He also won an historic precedent from the Southern District of New York that advertising showing hens frolicking outdoors is actionable as false advertising. Before coming to the PETA Foundation, Smith practiced commercial litigation at Paul Weiss in New York City, where he also handled pro bono cases on behalf of same-sex couples seeking to vindicate their constitutional rights and public housing tenants, among other clients. He graduated from Yale Law School. So how can thousands and thousands of animals at laboratories across the country be saved because of the Constitution's ban on bills of attainder? Here's Asher Smith, PETA Foundation attorney, on the PETA podcast. Thank you very much for just taking part in this. But, but tell me what this says, your lawsuit says, about the inadequacies of the Animal Welfare Act. So the Animal Welfare Act is a federal law that's existed since the early 1970s. It's actually the only federal law that protects animals. And what it's supposed to do is supply minimum standards for the humane treatment, transport, and handling of all warm-blooded animals. Now, as, as listeners to this podcast know, and people who followed what Pete has said about the Animal Welfare Act before, no, it's not a perfect law. There's a lot of horrible things that you can do under the Animal Welfare Act that are still okay. But the biggest hole in the Animal Welfare Act is the one we're challenging here, which is that in 2002, a senator from North Carolina, Jesse Helms, who had a long history as a segregationist, an opponent of civil rights, gay rights, you name it, sponsored and passed a law that says that birds, rats, and mice bred for use in research don't get any of the protections under the law. So what does that essentially do to the Animal Welfare Act? It really negates it. He was actually demolishing it uh, while it still exists as a kind of an empty frame. It really does with respect to animals used in, in laboratories. So there are tens and tens of millions of mice, rats, and birds used in research. And those are really most of the animals who are used in research. So for most animals that are having the worst things done to them in these laboratories, there's simply no federal protection. And so this law, the Animal Welfare Act has continued to exist. I mean, I I don't imagine, well, the Helms Amendment passed without much debate, or it seemed like in the excerpts in the debate that I've seen, it was fairly sarcastic on the part of Helms and and his his uh, cohorts in, in, in Congress just uh, went along with it, right? Congress went along with this unthinkingly. The only energy behind this really in Congress and the only floor speech that anyone gave for it 
was the speech delivered by Jesse Helms that you alluded to. And what it is, is Jesse Helms saying that Congress has to pass this exemption to the Animal Welfare Act to deliver a rebuke to animal rights activists. In this speech, he says that if there was a mouse in his house and he didn't call an exterminator immediately, his wife would be furious at him. So what we have here is is a unique law that really evinces an animus against these animals. It's not just neutral purposes. It's that Congress, speaking through Jesse Helms, thought that these animals' lives meant nothing. And so it essentially neutered the existing Animal Welfare Act, this amendment. And since 2002, the Animal Welfare Act has been allowed to be the law of the land in terms of what happens to animals in laboratories. Exactly. And and something that we try to do in our lawsuit is to explain exactly how this world would be different if we didn't have this exemption to the Animal Welfare Act. So how would the law be different? Part of A big part of what makes these experiments so gruesome is that to experiment on these owls, experimenters are drilling into all of their brains, stuffing them with electrodes. And that work is not being done by qualified surgeons. It's being done by students and postgrads who, in their grant application, the experimenters say they hope get learning experience from this. That's something that's specifically not okay in the Animal Welfare Act. Anyone performing surgery on a lab animal obviously has to be qualified for it. It's insane that you would even have to specify that. So, but where does it put the the sense of where what kind of care should be given to the animals if anyone can go in there and with a saw or do anything to these these animals? Exactly. It's a real black box, not just to PETA, but to the public and anyone interested in learning about these animals, what actually happens to them. What we know about these experiments comes from those few documents that are public. It comes from the experimenter's own grant applications. So when I'm describing the horror that these owls undergo, I'm using the experimenter's own words. If anything, I'm probably sugarcoating it. Yeah. And so we have this situation now at John Johns Hopkins University with the barn owls. And why does this rise to a level where PETA must challenge? PETA must challenge the Helms Amendment under the Animal Welfare Act and go and do this on behalf of the barn owls. Well, these experiments are so gruesome and so obviously the kind of torture and and death sentence that the Constitution doesn't allow, that it opens up this window for PETA to sue over and start this conversation about the Helms Amendment. Ultimately, this is a constitutional lawsuit. PETA's argument here is that the Constitution says that Congress can't pass any legislative punishment. They call it bills of attainder for reasons I'll be happy to explain. But to make a long story short, how do you decide if something is unconstitutional punishment? Well, the biggest test is you look at what kind of punishments and deprivations it inflicts on the victims. And right now, there's few examples as stark as the death sentence and torture that these owls are going to experience. Okay, so let's make a short story long. You're protecting the, the barn owls by use of the Constitution. The, saying these these barn owls should be constitutionally protected. Exactly. So what the Constitution says, and I'll just quote it here, is Congress shall not pass bills of attainder. That means not against anyone, not against you or me, not against disfavored political groups, not against, according to recent court decisions, against inanimate corporations. Yeah. All right. But, but bills of attainder, attainder meaning explain the, the legal way to, you know, attainder is applied. A bill of attainder. The language sounds technical, but I think it really illustrates our point here, which is that a bill of attainder was a favorite weapon of bloodthirsty English kings that they would use to have parliament consent to the execution for their political enemies. It's not 
a judicial process. It's not something that would be okay under any constitutional system. It was one of the first things during the Constitutional Convention that the framers agreed on. It was unanimous, and there was actually no debate over whether or not the Constitution should ban these. So essentially, it's Congress or any legal authority should not, by, by the Constitution, should not go after or target any one or a, a being, any a, a group. And where do the animals fit in under the Animal Welfare Act? How courts have interpreted this provision of the Constitution is that legislatures can't single out anyone or any group for punishment. There's a large body of decisions that make it clear that that can extend to large groups as long as they're identifiable. Let's go to the history of Bill of Attainder. Why does it apply here to those barnyard owls? Well, what the Constitution says here is that Congress can't pass any bills of attainder. It doesn't say that Congress can't pass any bills of attainder against individual people or against corporations. It just says Congress can't do it. And what courts have decided in the intervening centuries is that that's an exceptionally broad protection. Large groups benefit from these protections, even inanimate corporations benefit from these protections. And these these barn owls are really the, you know, except for the fact that they're owls and courts don't necessarily love protecting animals, they're really the perfect plaintiffs given how this doctrine has developed. Barn owls also are peculiarly vulnerable as exhibited by the fact that they're discriminated against by the law in this way. And this is really part of the Constitution that's intended to protect the peculiarly vulnerable. So it doesn't really say that, well, they have to be human. It, I mean, this is an animal protection law. So, you know, clearly it protects animals. But some people might say, oh, wait a minute, you can't extend the Constitution to protect non-humans, even though you know, we know corporations can be are, are essentially human now. But... What does that mean? What do you say to people who say, look, these are animals. Come on. They're not protected by the Constitution. Are they? The short answer is they are and should be. Uh, when PETA brought its 13th Amendment litigation to protect Tillicum, who is held in slavery at SeaWorld, the result was a decision that didn't decide in PETA's favor. The court didn't hold that the 13th Amendment protected this orca. But what the court acknowledged is that there very well could be constitutional protections that work for the benefit of animals. And we see that in multiple cases. There's a Ninth Circuit case acknowledging that animals can likely have standing to sue in federal courts, which means they have the ability to bring a lawsuit to vindicate their rights. We've seen state court decisions that acknowledge that even though a particular doctrine might not benefit animals, that animals do, in fact, likely have the ability to bring these kind of cases. Right. And this case is really really being brought not by the barn owls, but it's being brought by, by humans, by, by, by PETA. This lawsuit is being brought by PETA and by PETA's co-next friends, a current Johns Hopkins student and animal and climate justice activist and Dr. Martin Wasserman, the former Secretary of Health for the state of Maryland, because that's how you have to try to vindicate the rights of, of animals. You know, I think the easiest way to think of, of a case like this might be how would you go about vindicating the rights of children who obviously can't bring their own lawsuits? They can't hire a lawyer and write out a legal brief. Or how would you go about vindicating the legal rights of someone detained overseas. They can't access a U.S. federal courthouse. So you have this doctrine of next friend standing where this case is very much brought in the name of these 30 barn owls. But PETA and PETA's co-next friends are trying to do the work to vindicate their rights. Yeah, but once again, there might be people who say, okay, fine, for PETA, but these are animals. I guess that's a kind of speciesist view if people are trying to deny rights to the, the barn owls. But, 
I guess this is the step toward getting to exposing that species view in the law. Exactly. That, that's exactly how we see this case. We, we think that we're presenting a compelling legal argument. We think that we have identified a constitutional protection that places a blanket limit on congressional action and that the court should agree with us. But even if not, we hope that the court's consideration will lend itself to discussion, to activism, and to legislative action over this insanely egregious speciesist contradiction in in the law that says that some species merit protections, but some don't. And a lot of litigating for animals and litigating for civil rights is about continuously making arguments and cases that seem obvious to you, but not to other people, because eventually it does become obvious. We we saw just this year, the Supreme Court vindicated the rights of LGBTQ people to not be discriminated against by their employers because that discrimination violates federal law that says they can't be discriminated against on the basis of sex. That's a holding that should have been just as obvious in 1964 as it is now, but it it took the work and the groundwork of making it obvious to people. Yeah. You know, Asher, let's go back to the Helms amendment again, because it went after the animal welfare act and it discriminated against which animals did they say, well, the animal welfare act can protect some animals, but not all clearly not the barn barn owls, but where was the line drawn? What animals are not protected? by the Animal Welfare Act, and it should be protected. The line was drawn at the animals that are most commonly used in research, and that's birds, just birds generally. Just imagine how many different species of birds that is, mice and rats. And it really was because Congress didn't think that these species mattered, and that's obviously ridiculous. These animals are just as capable of of feelings and desires and personalities as as any other species. And a point that we make in in our lawsuit is we spend the time to describe what owl social structures are like, the fact that owls will cooperate to parent their young, that they exhibit altruism and, and cooperation, that they have complex communication skills. And, and I can tell you that that's not something that's unique to owls. It's something that all species exhibit. The, the mice and rats victimized by the Helms Amendment are similarly individuals with distinct personalities. Yeah, well, the owls are supposed to be icons of wisdom. They're supposed to be they're supposed to be considered the smartest of the smart, right? The Professor Owl, uh, and and now we're just sort of relegating them to that that side of the line. Well, you're not just saying. Uh, rats and, and and mice, but all birds, all birds. I mean, they fly, those birds. <laughs> they, they're they special beings, but no birds are protected at all? Not at all. It, it, it's crazy because I, I don't think if you were to ask 100 people out on the street, if they think there's any protections for any birds under federal law and what could be done to them in laboratories, they would think that was crazy because it is crazy. So what would you like to see? You'd like to, in order to get the protections you want, you have to just got the Helms amendment, say goodbye, abolish it. It's, it's gone. Right. I mean, that's, that's the argument. It, it, it's, it was bogus law, bad law and needs to need sand. We do what, what we need here. And, and the picture we're trying to paint for the court is exactly why the Helms Amendment was un- unconstitutional the day it was passed and needs to be abolished. And, you know, it's not a state of anarchy if you throw out the Helms Amendment as as much as we'd like to say, great, now you can't do anything to any animals in laboratories. That's not what the world's going to look like without the Helms Amendment. Without the Helms Amendment, though, we're going to have a world where Students can't cut into owls as tr- for trial and error as a learning experience, where owls can't undergo surgery without a- any kind of anesthesia. We're not going to have a-, a world where their deaths can be completely disposable and, and inhumane. 
And also in terms of the uh, techniques involved, you know, you're talking about the electrocution, uh, essentially paralyzing these animals, torture, they dehydrate them, they mutilate them. Uh, these, these kind of practices at all the labs will end if you get rid of the, uh, the Helms Amendment. Yeah, you know, I don't want to sit here and, and pretend that we have a perfect world without the Helms Amendment. Obviously, Peter's view, the correct view, is that the Animal Welfare Act isn't enough. It still allows a lot that's unconscionable, and it also devolves a lot of responsibility to the institutions that conduct these experiments to do their own oversight. But we think that the framework is there in the Animal Welfare Act. And, and one example I'll cite is that a very basic provision of the Animal Welfare Act is that the euthanasia of any animal has to be humane. Just humane. What does that mean? Well, Peter would argue that any sane, reasonable definition of the Animal Welfare Act would hold that you can't humanely treat these animals' lives as disposable and simply kill them all in mass after they cease being of use to experimenters. And part of what the benefit for the animals will be if the Helms Amendment is abolished is that PETA will then have the grounds to push its next arguments for how the USDA has to interpret the Animal Welfare Act. So you really see this as just another step in the journey toward this ideal sense of how animals are treated in, not just under the law, but in society in general. I, I mean, I do want to say that obviously in, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be using animals for these kind of experiments at all, but it very much is a, a one step in the process kind of thing. And something else that's really good about this provision of the Constitution and being able to make these arguments is that one thing that courts will look at to determine if a law is an unconstitutional bill of attainder is they'll ask if it has any non-punitive purpose. And when they ask that, they'll ask if it's if, if the punishment it inflicts is merely incidental to a non-punitive purpose. They'll ask if there's any protections or safeguards, and that leaves the door open for us to make our case that these experiments don't serve any purpose other than torturing owls. They, they really won't yield anything of use for humans at all, and that's not just the case here. It's the case with so many of these experiments. Because that probably is one of the, the, the big... Uh you know, comebacks to the, the, the case that, well, the, these experiments yield something for the benefit of mankind, no, or for the benefit of the world. These, this isn't junk science, is it? These experiments are junk science. I mean, it's really that simple. The, the, these are not exper experiments that are set up to yield human relevant conclusions. The stated purpose of these experiments is to learn something about attention deficit disorder and how the brain processes competing stimuli. But there's no comparison between how humans and owls process sight and sound. There's not even a comparison between the part of the brain they're using to process these sights and sounds, let alone the fact that any experiment performed on an animal undergoing the stress of this kind of torture will yield any kind of species typical outcomes. It, it's, it's just nuts. And, and why this experiment is such a vivid example is that we have in the experimenter's own grant application, their description of why they're doing these experiments. And what they say is that in large part, it's because it's easier to study owls. There's already a lot of data on owls that they'll be able to compare their data to. Is that useful data? No but it keeps the grant money flowing. How many millions of dollars, uh, because it, this is a, a taxpayer issue, how many millions of dollars is being wasted on this one experiment with the 30 barn owls and throughout uh, uh, the, uh, the laboratory research industry? 
I, I honestly don't have an exact number for you, but if you think about all the resources that have to go into experiments like this and this experiment just being one of many, it, it's astronomical. I mean, this experiment is being conducted with not just an ex- one experimenter in a basement, but a whole team using complex surgical equipment. There's the whole process of stuffing the electrodes in, into their brains and rinse and repeat that process and that kind of personnel and that kind of space for every single experiment like this. Are there pictures of the experiments that PETA was able to obtain or uh, is that just one of those things that uh, gets, you have to FOIA to, to get, get it out of the labs or is it uh, something that there's a visual that you can say, look, look at what they do, these barn, barn owls. We, we don't because, and you'd think these experimenters, if, if they were working on these noble experiments that would advance humanity, would let people see what they're doing. They don't. We know what we do because we have access, because we have access to their grant application. We have access to interviews they do about these experiments. In one case, they happen to publish some audio of one of these owls and we have that we have the sound of this owl speaking but that's it we really have their own words for what they're doing and that is one of the most horrifying things about this that for all the gore i'm describing i'm describing it based on what they're willing to disclose i can only imagine what these experiments entail that they haven't revealed so now you're, this is a case that's being called the first of its kind. Why has it taken so long to uh, apply? I mean, this is a bit of, some people might say, creative law, or maybe is the, the sign of changing times or a new sensitivity to animals. But why is it the first of its kind to use the Constitution, specifically the Bill of Attainder um, you know, idea, why, why has it come only now in 2020? You know, it takes continuous activism and it takes continuous attention being drawn to issues to make them seem obvious, to even make them seem obvious to activists in terms of articulating what they want. And it's also a process of, of trying and I, I wouldn't say failing, but trying and seeing where those earlier attempts lead. You know, I was a first year law student when PETA launched its 13th Amendment litigation over Tillicum at SeaWorld. And I was really inspired by that case. And if you go look at what the judge wrote in dismissing the case and in declaring that PETA lost, for lack of a better word, what the judge said is that, well, I'm looking at the history of the 13th Amendment, which was about the abolition of African chattel slavery in the United States. And I simply think that because of the specific grounds and purposes of the 13th Amendment, that it doesn't apply here, but other protections could apply. So once we have these building blocks, we're able to learn how to strategically frame our next argument. And we'd like to think that with the Bill of Attainder Clause, we've found a constitutional protection that by that, that through its extraordinary breadth, through the fact that it's been applied to corporations and because of the fact that it's intended to protect the peculiarly vulnerable, that it's the kind of vehicle we can use for this purpose. Where barn owls are protected by the constitution. That sounds like an uphill battle, but I think it sounds like the law could be on your side here. We certainly think it it will be. And, and, you know, I can't predict, and, and any litigator you ever speak to will never predict what a judge is going to do. We hope the judge will see it our way. But but regardless, we, we think that the force of this argument should be so strong that it inspires other people, not just to bring similar lawsuits, which, which we'd love to see, but to start talking about more species as contradictions in, in the law and more ways that the law arbitrarily and and unethically and cruelly victimizes different kinds of animals. P. 
indeed is Asher Smith, PETA Foundation lawyer who is now fighting the Animal Welfare Act's exclusion of birds, rats, and mice on constitutional grounds because such a ban is an unlawful bill of attainder. Find out more on PETA.org. And that's our show for today. Hey, thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. You like the PETA podcast. Tell your friends. Contact us at PETA.org. Hey, you can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K or on AMOK.com. Or you can see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.